Welcome to The Prescription, the Tax Policy Center's bi-weekly webcast on fiscal policy. This is one of a series of conversations with state, local, and federal government officials, as well as leading economists and other experts. I'm your host, Howard Gleckman, a senior fellow at TPC and editor of our blog, TaxVox. My guest today is Adam Ozemek, chief economist at the Economic Innovation Group. Previously, Adam was chief economist at Upwork, where he led research and labor market research on labor market trends. He also has been a senior economist at Moody's Analytics, where he managed U.S. demographic forecasts and research, and was director of research at Econsult Solutions, an economics consulting firm in Philadelphia. He has his PhD in economics from Temple University. Before we begin, uh, our usual bit of housekeeping. We encourage audience members to submit questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. The event is being recorded and will be posted online at TPC's website. We're using captioning, which you can adjust or turn off with the live transcript button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. If you'd like to join the conversation on social media, please use the hashtag live at urban. And if you'd like to suggest a future guest for the prescription, just email us at info at taxpolicycenter.org. Adam Ozemek, welcome to the prescription. Howard, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Good to see you. So it's not news that the pandemic turned millions of white collar and other professionals into remote workers. Uh, many of us haven't been in our offices in two years. And while people are beginning to return to their before times workplaces, many still are not. So assuming, assuming no big new COVID wave, what will office work look like a year from now? Uh, it's a great question. And um, obviously there's a ton of uncertainty around this. You have uh, two different um, preferences on this, workers and managers. Uh, workers want somewhat more uh, work from home than managers do. Workers want uh, 32% of they, 32% of them want to be working from home full-time. And uh, I think 15% or so of them want to be working from home, well, 15% of managers want workers full-time. And then you have a uh, hybrid work as well. Uh, my, my best guess is that somewhere between, you know, around 20% will be full-time remote and then another 15% will be hybrid remote. And that's obviously a significant increase from pre-pandemic levels where we have somewhere between five to eight percent uh, full-time remote, and then you know another like ten percent or so uh, hybrid remote. So significant increase. And my belief is that full-time remote will be um, relatively more popular than some other experts are thinking. So, in a recent study, you used a very unusual word for an economist. You said remote work is changing business forever. Uh, that's a long time. Uh, so let's think about at least the medium and long term. What what happens over say five years? Is, is does the trend continue, or does as if COVID recedes, do we start to go back to to more office work? What do you think? Uh, there's, I think most signs suggest the continuation of the trend, and that the longer run could be even more remote than sort of the next uh, year or two. Now, obviously, people are going back to the office. Uh, they're going back now. They're going back over the next six months. So. The current rates, we're probably looking at somewhere like still around half of 40% of workers who are working remote to some extent, and that's going to come down as offices open back up. But I think it's going to still remain significantly above pre-pandemic levels. In the longer term, you have factors that are going to help drive remote work adoption even further. One of those is the creation of remote first startups. Um, right now, businesses are dealing with the challenge of adapting long-standing practices and organizational firms and uh, you know labor forces, their, their workers, to a new way of working. Uh, some of the workers might not want to work that way. Some of the processes might not work that way. Um, you know, it's, it's a major adaptation. Uh, their workplace culture might not jive with it. And so when you have that opens up an opportunity for remote first startups to build remote from the beginning, and I think that's going to be something that leans us towards more remote over the long term. The other thing, of course, is work from home innovation. Uh, Nick Bloom has a great uh, chart that was just updated that shows a share of patents that cite work from home technology or appear to be about work from home technology. And it's just skyrocketed since pre-pandemic and it continues to go up and up and up. So more and more patents related to work from home research. You put all these things together, and I think that you know the the medium to long term is is pretty optimistic for uh, working from home. So let's talk a little bit about how this changes the relationship between workers and their bosses and their employers. 
So before the pandemic, younger workers already had relatively little long-term commitment to their employers. People change jobs pretty frequently. And now you predict growing use of freelancers who it seems will have even less of a commitment beyond the purely transactional. What's that gonna mean for the, for the relationships between, between workers and, the, and, their, and their firms? So in the short run, I think we're going to continue to see more turnover in the labor market. Uh, not every company is going to be remote. Not every occupation is going to be remote. And you're going to have a sorting of workers who want to be with remote companies, sorting to remote companies, and who don't want to be remote, sorting to other companies. So I do expect you know, elevated levels of, uh, of turnover and quits. Uh, I think an important piece of context, for and then you know, going forward, um, I do think it's quite possible that remote work is going to weaken workers' attachment to their firms, and um, it'll certainly provide more matching opportunities. Right for fully remote workers and fully remote firms, you're not just stuck with the employers who happen to be in your local labor market. Uh, you can find employers all over the place, so it, it provides more opportunity for matching. It provides a uh, higher opportunity cost if you are sort of matched with an employer who's not a great fit for you. So I do think that is going to be um, something that leans into more turnover in the labor market. But a really important piece of context here is, you know, a study that was just put out by um, my colleagues, John Latier and Ken Fikri at the Economic Innovation Group, is all about the decline in dynamism over time. We have this sort of myth that labor markets are so dynamic compared to what they used to be, that people have low attachment to the firms, that uh, millennials are just these crazy job hoppers going from one thing to the next. Uh, on average, people change jobs less than they used to. They stay with employers for longer than they used to. And that's not a good thing um, necessarily because you know that reduces churn in the labor market. People changing jobs is a great way to get um, uh, wage growth to get promotions and also to circulate information and knowledge throughout the economy. So I would argue, yes, um, it's more likely than not that remote work will weaken people's attachments, but that's going to happen through better outside opportunities. And that's going to put us more towards the historical levels of labor market churn we've had. And that that's a good thing. And, and is this, it seems like what you're applying here is this actually puts more of the leverage on workers. You know, we've gone through a period where workers, particularly certain low wage workers, have had uh, relatively little leverage. Um, now, now post COVID, we, we're seeing you know people pushing for for higher wages, and you seem to be implying that that this may suggest that another change in that dynamic. I think in labor markets where workers don't have great outside options um, and their jobs are remotable, it's going to increase their leverage, but. Um, the thing that's mostly going to increase leverage is a return to full employment, which we haven't had in over a decade. So those things together are going to increase leverage. But uh, there's another way to think about it, which isn't about leverage per se, but it's about matching opportunities. If you look at a town where you have, um, you know, 10 men and 10 women and uh, look at the dating market there, and then you compare that to a, a city with uh, a million men and a million women, um, it, has anyone's leverage gone up? comparing one to the other, it's not really about the increase in leverage. It's about the increase in better matching opportunities. And that's pro-productivity. Um, you know, it's, it's pro-wage growth, it's pro-innovation, but it's not necessarily about leverage per se. It, but I do think that we do have, um, you know, some examples of places where you do have that sort of leverage where there's not enough employers because of the, again, because of the declining dynamism in the economy. And so for workers who are sort of stuck in those places, yes, I do think that will increase leverage. So another trend we, we're beginning to see is a, a, a growth and in interest in unionization. Uh, you know, you, the Starbucks baristas, that sort of thing. Uh, do you think that this is going to affect the, that the, the rise of remote work is going to change in any way this interest in unionization and collective bargaining among, among these workers? Well, if you look at the share of jobs that are unionized, uh, it hasn't really changed over the last few years. Um, you know, you're really mostly continuing a structural decline. So I actually think what we're seeing more is uh, immediate interest in unionization stories. Um, yes, we have some interesting examples, such as the Starbucks being unionized, but we're talking about, you know, single location. Uh, the outlook for the unionization of retail is just not great. I mean, I think people who, um, yeah, you know, labor economists who you would think of as being pro-labor, think of as being like uh, in favor of greater levels of unionization. I think they would agree with that. Leisure and hospitality, retail, these aren't highly unionizable sectors. We're not going to see 
a shift there and, and simply having more media interest in a handful of case studies doesn't change that. And that's why they'd argue for more fundamental changes to labor laws, because they understand, you know, it, it's very hard in a sector with, with a lot of churn and competition. And, you know, when you're talking about small establishments um, where startups are easy to place, and it's, it's a, that's a harder uh, kind of thing to unionize one, one firm at a time. And it also, it, this may be wrong, but it also seems like it'd be more difficult to unionize when people are working remotely. They don't really have an opportunity to get to know each other, to socialize, uh, you know, off the job. Seems like it would also be more difficult. Does that make sense or am I making that up? Uh, I mean, that, there's a compelling logic to that, I think, but I think that's less important than the fact that when you're talking about skilled jobs, which remote work disproportionately is, there's, uh, I think there's less interest in unionization because you have like more uh, heterogeneity and productivity and, you know, people, people don't necessarily feel the need for the equalization factor of unionization when you're talking about like among accountants or like graphic designers or something like that. I think people tend to prefer the system where like, you know, first off, they're generally well-paid jobs, but also that like where, um, you know, superstars can emerge or like higher paid people can emerge. And like, I'm not sure people feel that we have too much within firm or occupation inequality among the higher skilled sector of the labor market as compared to between the high skilled sector and the low skilled sector. So let's talk a little bit about places. Uh, when we talk about people, let's talk about places. So before the pandemic, we saw waves of tech workers going into places like Silicon Valley and Seattle and Austin. And we were told a lot about this great benefit of having a critical mass of creative and entrepreneurial geniuses located in one place. Now it seems the tech ecosystem can be anywhere. Uh, has something changed permanently or is this just another one of these COVID things? Yeah, I do think that's true. And it's going to be dependent on what kind of occupation and industry you're talking about. There's going to continue to be occupations and industry where being co-located has, has those spillovers and has those agglomeration benefits. But I do think that the growth and acceptance of remote work is going to take um, some, some occupations, some activities, some businesses, some industries, and allow them to kind of be done anywhere. And that is going to mean taking, you know, unlocking the agglomeration that was previously sort of bound up in specific geographies and, and letting that exist uh, more spatially equal across the U.S. I also think that on, on the other side, when you think about not just from the perspective of like spillovers within workers and firms, but like if you're going to start, have a startup, you need to um, pre-pandemic be in the area where there are workers with skills that you need. So if you're looking about like looking at like a struggling place or like, you know, um, a second or third tier city, uh, one of the constraints to starting a startup there was access to labor. And so I do think that um, an increase in remote work, uh, building remote for startups is going to make it easier for people who you know, there's like a latent demand there for startups and entrepreneurs. Like you're, it's not that there aren't entrepreneurs in those places. It's not like there aren't people who want to build startups in those places. It's just been traditionally difficult. And so I think lowering the barrier there to growth, increasing effect, their effective labor market access, their access to skilled workers is going to be something that's going to have very um, place specific uh, effects. So, so let's explore that a little bit more. So what can you do if you're one of these small towns or a, or a mid-sized city? What do you do to attract these high-skilled workers? Yeah, I think it's a very interesting question, the effect this is going to have on the incentives of local government. Um, traditionally, what there's a chicken and egg problem where if you want to lure in high-skilled workers, you need high-skilled employers. If you want to lure in high-skilled uh, employers, you need high-skilled workers. So you have this chicken and egg problem. And a lot of times um, local governments, uh, local economic development authorities got around this with huge incentives, right? Like, okay, we'll give you like a hundred years without property taxes or something like that. Um, there's an economic rationale for that in these places uh, to lure in the big businesses. It's not as irrational as economists sometimes make it seem. The problem is that on average places do end up uh, tending to overpay. Uh, and so I think remote work is gonna lean against this trend because it breaks the chicken and egg problem you don't need Google to open an office in your city in order to lure in Google workers anymore. And so it really changes the calculus about what do we think about um, in terms of getting that sort of that process of workers and firms flowing. And it's more worker specific. 
and it sort of turns governance back to i think it will um focus on things that should have been focused on all along in a good in a good governance sense which is helping to create amenities making sure like money is spent well like efficient taxing and public service provision um quality of life issues providing you know good infrastructure at a good cost good schools at a good cost like those are things we want governments to be doing anyway and when you don't have to worry as much about luring in big business i think it's going to turn focus back in that direction a little bit so that's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem too right you, you know, if you don't have the tax base how do you pay for the good schools and the good infrastructure you know so yeah so what do you do so I mean, I think some of this is going to be naturally occurring. Like, it's not like they don't have to go out and find every remote worker, um, sit down with them and convince them to move there. I think what we're seeing already is sort of a natural movement of people out of the superstar cities into other parts of the country. And hopefully that'll be, you know, a catalyst for some of these places. Um, and that sort of gets the ball rolling for them. And then they can figure out from there, how do we do it? But it's not always about spending more money it's also about spending money better but yes having remote workers move in from the start to provide uh more uh tax revenues i think will be helpful too and it, so it seems like what you're saying is the days of you know i'm seeing this locally here where the state of virginia is talking about giving dan snyder a billion dollars in in uh, in, in subsidies taxes and bonds and other and other subsidies to build a new football stadium in northern virginia in the hopes that that is going to generate all sorts of economic development. Um, it, it sounds like what you're saying is that that story may be coming to a, a little bit of, a, of an end, that, that, that local governments are going to focus on, on different priorities. Yeah, and it's actually a little bit of an irony here, which is I think that the need, the less need to focus on big businesses is going to be true for a lot of places. But I think places that had a major downtown business area um and are su suddenly seeing like huge office vacancies they may for a time feel pressure to become even more aggressive with incentives so like you know all of a sudden you have this what was a bustling downtown now the uh you know the offices are only 40 percent occupied uh that's having negative spillovers so i think the right answer there is to be converting these to residential and other uses but that takes time and I wouldn't be surprised to see some places become somewhat desperate in the short run, trying to get lure, you know, whoever into their downtown. Mm -hmm. So we, we've been mostly been talking about highly educated skilled workers. And I wonder what what happens in this new economy to these low wage workers, such as restaurant servers and home health aides. Some of some of those restaurant servers working in those restaurants that used to be downtown and aren't anymore because there's no there's no clients, no customers. Yeah, so there's a couple of interesting studies recently that I think are important here. Uh, David Card had a study that just came out, and uh, Rebecca Diamond and Marika Monretti. And what they've suggested, they're looking at you know differences in um, real wages across uh, U.S. geography. And I think what researchers are finding is big superstar cities weren't a great deal for lower educated workers to begin with, because while there may be agglomerations for rents for them that push up wage growth um and while there may be lots of you know high income people in those areas which generates service sector demand uh they're super expensive places to live and that you know real wages were uh, eroded by housing costs so i don't think it was a great deal for them to begin with and i think what we're going to see is services demand becomes more located uh near residential demand and I think if you look at a service sector worker who was previously, you know, doing a long commute into the downtown to work in a restaurant because there's a lot of office uh, demand, I don't know that that person's going to be worse off. They may end up with a shorter commute if it means more leisure and hospitality spending closer to where they live so they can find a job near to them. They can find and then they can live in places where uh, wages aren't like eroded by massive land rents. So it's interesting you talk about commuting. I'm, I'm thinking about that myself. So it, it seems that a big challenge for a lot of this population may actually be getting to work. So many of them don't have cars. They, they have to rely on public transportation. How are they going to cope when, when, as we've been talking about, they've been displaced from these, these jobs in the urban core uh, or even close in suburbs and public transit in many cities is in deep financial trouble. 
uh, transit routes are frequently based on this hub and spoke design. Um, what are they going to do? How are they going to get to work? And what does that mean for, for, for the, the opportunity to connect labor with, uh, with the jobs? Yeah, I mean, public transit agencies are certainly going to be in um, a situation from this. If, uh, and they, they clearly are struggling to convince people to come back. So from the transit agency perspective, I think this is a problem. And it's going to probably require some maybe state or federal bailouts or something. From the worker perspective, though, I go back to the point that the cities weren't a great deal for them. And, you know, if you're moving from the most expensive cities in the country to uh, more affordable cost of living places where they actually build new houses when housing demand goes up, you can save a lot of money on expenses that, you know, makes uh, buying a car more affordable. Uh, and, and, you know, it is a car is a car centric country in a lot of places. So I do think that is going to be part of the reality is people who move to lower cost living places are going to spend more money on cars, but they'll have more money um, as a result of the lack of um, the lack of housing costs. And also they'll have more time because commutes are going to be lower. We've been talking uh, domestically, we're talking about movement of workers within the U S you recently did a very interesting paper looking at remote work around the world. And you found, among other results, that the U.S. is a next net exporter of remote worker services, but that firms pay significant wage premium for U.S.-based remote workers. And I guess that raises the question, is that premium sustainable? Um, it's a great question. So I think an important place to start here is, like, why is the U.S. like the highest income big country in the world? Like, why do workers make more here? And um, I think a big part of it is that uh, we have competitive advantage in professional skilled services. And so increasing trade with the world is not necessarily a bad thing for the area, for people working in the areas where you have a competitive advantage and in the areas where, like you say, we are currently net exporters. So do I think that the U.S. pay premium in professional skilled services will fall over time? Yes, but I think that's going to be more about global convergence um, of professional skilled service productivity and pay with the U.S. than the U.S. Uh, seeing the declining premium. Um, I think that's a good thing. You know, other countries can benefit from access to U.S. skilled workers, especially if they're trying to sell something to U.S. Um, uh, you know, to uh, U.S. consumers. Then hiring people in sales and marketing uh, in the U.S. market is advantageous. So. I mean, yes, I expect wage convergence. I think wage convergence is a longstanding historical trend. I think it's a good thing. I think it doesn't mean lower wages here. And, uh, you know, as wages do converge, um, that's going to mean more consumer spending power in other countries, which means more U.S. demand for exports there, too. So we got a question from a member of the audience about this as well. It says, uh, some remote work is competing with workers in other countries, engineering in particular, engineers in the U.S. doing freelance will be competing with engineers in developing countries who accept lower pay per contract. And many jobs done remotely don't pay benefits. How will this affect Social Security and health insurance policy? Yeah, I mean, um, I think we have obviously a health care cost problem in this country. That's true for like people who are getting their health insurance paid by their employer. And it's true for people who are paying for it themselves. I think that self-employed engineers are definitely uh, tend to be at the income level where uh, participating in, uh, you know, for example, ACA exchanges is affordable. Doesn't mean, you know, that's a great deal for them, but like no one's getting a great deal on healthcare in this country. So that's like an, that's like an everybody problem, but it is less of a problem for higher income people. Um, my research does show that skilled workers in the U.S. earn a premium even when they're being hired by country uh, companies in other countries. So I think that there does tend to be a little bit of paranoia here. Um, I also think that if we're talking about skilled services, um, you know, inequality between skilled workers and low skilled workers is uh, is an issue here too as well. So if we do see some sort of reduction in the skilled wage premium, um, that doesn't mean that anyone's getting lower pay. It just means like convergence in wages and, you know, a reduction in inequality. Let me, uh, l l let's ask about some of the, let me ask you about some of the policy issues that this, uh, that, that these, that this, this trend raises. Um, there is, as you know, an ongoing and growing dispute over who gets to tax the labor income of remote workers. So there are 
New York and Connecticut are fighting about it. Massachusetts and New Hampshire almost got to the Supreme Court. There are even issues within states. Um, you know, Philadelphia has a payroll tax. Uh, you, you're aware of this, I'm sure, because you work for a business in Philadelphia, but you don't live there. I'm not going to ask you about the law. You're an economist. So you shouldn't have to worry about that. But how should jurisdictions think about this? Say I live in Connecticut. I work for a Manhattan-based employer, but I've never set foot in New York. Uh, from an economist's point of view, where do I work? Uh, it's a great question. I think we should think about it through uh, like um, a competitive places lens. Um, and I think that you know the Philadelphia wage tax is a great example. They've been lowering it over time. Uh, and they've been trying to lower as much as they can. And you have to, why are they doing that? And it's because they're facing intense competition from their suburbs. Philadelphia is an example of a city that I think is pretty interesting in light of remote work because like they're facing a challenge that's sort of the cat already out of the bag, um, which is that like they have in the Philly suburbs, basically a conglomeration. Um, there are a ton of employers in the Philly suburbs. You have almost as many commuting into the suburbs from the city as a reverse. And so they face really strong competition for business location. The kind of thing that a lot of cities uh, are just starting to face now because of remote work. And so like Philadelphia, I think that we look at the lesson there. What happened when the city faced more spatial competition? They had to lower their wage taxes, right? I think that's what we're going to see is that superstar cities that previously enjoyed huge uh, premiums uh, in land prices uh, and commercial rents due to uh, like a monopoly over the local labor market, they're going to see that monopoly power decline and that's going to affect rents. And I think it's also going to affect taxing capacity and they're going to find that uh, businesses and people are more responsive to taxation than they used to be because they don't have the same strength of market power that they used to have. So all of this seems to suggest some sort of a, I don't know, an equilibrium maybe that we're going to reach between those, those as you call them, the superstar cities and other communities that have not yet benefited from a lot of the, the explosion of tech. And now they may begin to do that. Yeah, and I think it's sort of leaning against the 30-year trend of increased opportunity being uh, hoarded in a handful of superstar cities and skilled people migrating out of the rest of the country to those superstar cities. I think we're going to see sort of a trend in the opposite direction, or at least, you know, leaning in that direction. And that's, that's a positive thing. So we got a couple of minutes left, and I have to ask you, uh, uh, when you're not being an economist, you own a bowling alley, arcade, and restaurant in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. So two questions, why Lancaster? And how does remote work affect your business? Uh, it's a great question. Uh, Lancaster is just where I'm from. So this is where I was gonna live. Uh, I like it here. I don't really have a ton of interest in going elsewhere. So that's why I would do something in Lancaster. Then the question is, why is Lancaster a place where you would wanna do something like this? And uh, it is illustrative to me personally to. To, to see what's happening in the community around you because Lancaster is actually a reasonable population growth metro uh, county compared to a lot of Pennsylvania. A lot of Pennsylvania is seeing population declines, um, high vacancies that go with that. Lancaster is sort of the opposite. We're tracking closer to U.S. level population growth. And that's a huge benefit to someone looking to start a new business because it means that you know, population is growing and you have new customers and new employer or new employees um, and you don't it's not a zero-sum competition where in order to take to get new clients you have to take them from someone else in order to get to new workers you have to take them from some out someone else and this is i think why we're seeing in, in the literature increasing relationship between population growth and entrepreneurship at the local level uh it's very important and you know i see it play out here um for sure. In, in, in remote work, I, the one of the interesting things we're seeing is we have a huge demand for uh, business events at uh, the bowling alley. Like it's a great place for people to, for businesses to have a, a small gathering or a party because you know you can play games together. You're not just all sitting around the table at the Olive Garden. Um, and we've seen an increased demand for that. So I think what we're witnessing is businesses who are going remote or more hybrid 
they're spending less time together in the office. And so there's an increased demand for like socialization opportunities with coworkers. Um, and they also have, you know, probably some savings as well uh, from less need for office space. So that's something I expect to continue. Interesting. So, so our, our, our Zoom relationships, just, just having relationships as tiles on Zoom was really still not enough. We, 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 that bowling alone thing is, had something to it. We, we actually literally do want to spend some time with each other. Strong bowling demand. Interesting. Adam Ozema, thank you so much for taking the time. This has been a fascinating conversation. Um, and uh, let's kind of see where this all goes. So thank yep, you to thanks. you and thanks to our audience. Thanks for having me. Thank you.